Welcome back to Curious Combinations and Everything's an Original Podcast. I'm AF Tanith, and today I'm covering the finale and the penultimate episode of Archive 81, Season 1. That is Episode 7 and Episode 8. So, um, yeah. Now that I've seen the entire first season of this show, I have reached the moment when I can officially declare that this is just not very good. Um, it's really kind of a mess, which I feel is a shame because I think there's all the building blocks here to have told an interesting horror story. This is not like Dark, where the finale was so awful to me because it betrayed my trust in the writers and squandered all the goodwill that the previous two seasons had bought. This instead just stayed a kind of mediocre, like, D-plus, C-minus show that snatched snippets of plot from better stories, including its own mostly forgotten source material, The Black Tapes, The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, and on. And it didn't do anything particularly interesting with the unique batter it mixed with all of these tried-and-true ingredients. Now, I do not mean to imply for a second that I am complaining about seeing The Black Tapes, The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, The Ring, at all in the DNA of the show. That is antithetical to the entire premise of everything's unoriginal. Stories are not original. Stories are fundamentally derivative. The only way we get anything new in fiction is when we invent new technology or shift to new cultural norms that we have to incorporate into our narratives. And even that is often not really us getting anything new. It's just updating older ideas to fit the new reality. Mark Twain, for example, dreamed up a version of the internet way back in his 1898 work from the London Times of 1904. Ray Bradbury had a hypothetical version of social media in 1953's Fahrenheit 451. And the titular object from 1979's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the galaxy was pretty much a smartphone before smartphones existed. So when I say that I see other shows here, I don't mean that this is fundamentally a bad thing. There are no new stories. There are barely even ever any new building blocks to include in your stories. Everyone that's plotting, writing, or even daydreaming up a story is using the same tropes and archetypes and settings and whatnot to get wildly different results, and that's not a bad thing. That is fun. What I do mean to say, though, is that Archive 81 managed to take a bunch of building blocks that I should love, that I usually love, and somehow put them together into a leaning tower that's just too close to falling over to be enjoyable. But let's get into this recap, shall we? Episode 7 opens with educational footage about the Karin Comet. I wish it were clearer what the Comet actually has to do with Kalego. Like, what connection does Karin actually have to some demon trapped in another world? I don't know, and the show isn't telling. The Karin Comet appears to just be the ferryman, whose appearance in near-Earth orbit allows the ritual to take place. There is the interesting element added here in this opening of a counterpart to the Comet, which collided with Earth at some point and left behind Karinite, and that definitely has potential. Though I've got to admit that I was distracted from the show for a minute here by trying to remember where I've heard this thing before. So go ahead. You guess where I have heard this concept before. You're never going to get it. Just throw something out there. Make your best guess. And if you do manage to get it somehow, you are my new best friend. Okay, so have you guessed? Here's the actual answer. This is from A Song of Ice and Fire. In the mythology that's going on in the background of A Song of Ice and Fire, there is this myth that once upon a time there were actually two moons. One of them, if I'm recalling this correctly, got too close to the sun and burst open like an egg, spawning the dragons which fell to earth. Now, if you listen to or read the mythical astronomy of Ice and Fire, you will be familiar with Astronomy Explains the Legends of Ice and Fire, which gets into this myth and its relation to the Red Comet and the Long Night. It is hella interesting analysis of Martin's work, and I will, of course, leave a link in the show notes. And while it's not like concretely relevant to this story, I was definitely distracted by the similarities. I even see a bit of similarity here between the sparkly mold that's associated with Kalego and Karin and Karnite and the oily black stone lurking in the background of the A Song of Ice and Fire universe. But while Martin mostly just hints at his story's cosmic horror elements, I kind of feel like Archive 81 squandered theirs. As we move into Dan's storyline, we get a nice little creepy moment of what I wish the show had done more. Dan has a waking dream in which he goes to the mirror to find the black mold coating his teeth, and he begins to vomit and cough it up. It's inside him, and that is terrifying, even if it is just a dream. But the show doesn't really do all that much with this notion, though, just as Dark didn't actually end up doing anything interesting with its specters of Marta and Michael being coated in cesium, or Jonas's early dreams of having cesium leaking from his ear. It's just for flavor, which is fine, provided the rest of the show harmonizes with this decision. And while I think Archive 81 tried to do that, I don't really think it succeeded. In order for this creepy dream to slot properly into the rest of the narrative, the story would really have to nail an ongoing sense of creepiness and menace and infection and cosmic horror, and it just doesn't. It could go really hard into being kind of a color out of space horror story dealing with a demon associated comet and a cult of people all losing their grip on reality and an infectious creeping mold, 
but instead it chooses not to really lean into those elements and so tries to just tell a pretty mundane cult story with these elements instead sprinkled in for flavor. H.P. Lovecraft this is not, though they're definitely writing in his legacy and again, kind of squandering it. But anyway, Dan's back at his own place when he wakes, which is disorienting and frightening from his point of view and kind of confusing from mine. I really wasn't expecting Virgil to just dump him back at his own place. I was expecting something far more sinister to happen to him to cement Virgil as a villain. Instead, Davenport genuinely seems to want Dan to be done with the investigation at this point. It comes across as more of a kindness towards Dan than anything else. Dan got in too deep, so they let him go. I mean, the gaslighting certainly isn't great, but it kind of seems like Davenport is just trying to dump him back into the safety of his normal life at this point. He even kept his end of the deal, paying Dan for a job well done. But Dan, of course, is not willing to let this go. He storms into Davenport's office only to find that Davenport is not there, but he is expecting him. On a video call, Dan throws his accusations out and Virgil shuts him down. Again, it's definitely gaslighting, but like, I'm not really mad about it. I honestly don't really think that Dan has any good reason to stay so invested in the plot at this point. He really just comes across as kind of obsessive for little to no reason, and you can't even blame it on the mold or the tapes getting to him. It doesn't make sense for him to agree to take this job in the first place, it didn't make sense for him to stick around once things started getting weird, and it doesn't make sense for him to put himself back into danger to save some dead woman he's never met. It's like he's fully obsessed with Melody at this point, and I just find that truly a bizarre writing decision. I mean, if it was that he was completely obsessed with finding out the truth about the circumstances of his dad and his sisters and presumably his mother's deaths, that would at least make some sense. But as it is, it seems like he's completely lost his mind over some woman he's never met, potentially with the implication that he fancies himself some degree of in love with her. And in case anyone listening is unclear, you cannot be in love with a person with whom you have never actually interacted. No, Dan's dreams do not count, not even if he thinks they really happened in some capacity. Dan has truly never met Melody. He's never even emailed her or texted her or anything like that. This is absolutely nothing more than a parasocial relationship, and that Dan is fully willing to risk his life, not to mention Mark's life, over his obsession with Melody really cements Dan as pretty mentally ill. He needs to seek help for this. This is a really self-endangering, self-harming, self-sabotaging part of his personality. He needs someone to help him work through this, because this is unhinged. Like, forget the mold, and the tapes, and anything else that might be affecting his behavior. This inexplicable drive to save some dead or missing woman he's never even met is behavior that needs to be addressed. He is essentially just a dude that watched some old tapes of an old friend of his dad, and has now decided to dedicate his life and potential death to her. It's so flimsy, and it's so close to just being a stalking situation that it is concerning, to say the least. I'm just saying that Dan needs stronger motivation here, I think. It doesn't even need to be like a big change. I would suggest that instead of having Dan dream about interacting with her while she's at the Visser, maybe replace those dreams with dreams of her being trapped in the demon dimension and like begging him or someone in general to save her. That way he would know that she is trapped, she is alive, and she does in fact need his help, and he can convince himself that he is the only person equipped to do that. Because right now, he's convinced himself exactly of that in a way that feels like grasping at straws. But anyway, Dan gets back to his apartment to find Mark looking for a projector. Now that Mark is on screen, I want to take a moment to pause and let you know a fun little fact that I found out after watching the next episode. I went poking around Reddit to try to get a feel for what everybody else thought of this show, and somebody absolutely blew my mind. Do you recognize the actor playing Mark? I didn't, but I should have. He's from Orange is the New Black. The cop that fathered Daya's baby? That's him. I genuinely didn't recognize him at all. He looks so much better in this. I was really shocked. But back to the show. Dan shows Mark the Bellows tapes, and Mark shows Dan the William Cress collection of tapes and documents. Mark tells him all about the Voss Society and the supreme being they were trying to pull out of a hell dimension. He explains that the snuff film that inspired the circle was a Voss Society recording that somehow survived the fire at the Voss mansion, and that the Voss siblings were obsessed with spirit photography, and unlike Mary Todd Lincoln, they were trying to see their favorite demon, not their lost loved ones. Cut to 1924, shortly before the Voss fire. I'm going to say right up front that I think this entire extended flashback sequence was an enormous waste of time and didn't add anything to the show that a few lines of dialogue or a viewing of the snuff film couldn't have added. But let's get into this anyway. 
A young woman, or perhaps a teenage girl, named Rose is being interviewed by Iris Voss for the job of her new maid. She's an orphan, given that the rest of her family died trying to immigrate to America, which makes her the perfect potential victim for the cult. No one is going to come looking for her when she's gone. So Iris shows Rose a music box that plays the cult song, Caligo's Prayer, and then they discuss religion. Rose admits to being agnostic or atheistic in your very stereotypical, can you believe what God did to me, Hollywood fashion? And I am truly, desperately begging the media to start portraying atheists more accurately than that. But this further cements the Christian supremacist themes of the narrative, which really upsets me. And I will be getting into that some more over the course of the rest of this episode and the next, but let me just say, I'm not amused. I am not a pagan. I find all religious and spiritual beliefs to be pretty much equally silly, but I will stick up for literally anyone when Christians start picking on them. Like, as much as I'm begging for more accurate atheist representation, can we also stop writing evil imaginary pagans to prop up the idea that Christianity is some kind of an inherent cosmic good? That shit's fucking offensive. More importantly for the narrative, though, is the simple fact that you cannot do Lovecraft and Christian supremacy at the same time. A deep distrust of pagans and cults and whatnot was inherent to Lovecraft's writing, yes, but that's because the man was an unforgivable racist. He painted non-Christian religions as villainous because he thought non-whites were villainous. But the dude wasn't a Christian, the dude was a fucking atheist. Setting up Christianity as opposition to a cosmic demon cult fundamentally betrays the Lovecraftian themes that are happening in this story. And I cannot hope to effectively communicate how angry that makes me. Like, either do a Christianity versus demons story, or do a Lovecraftian cosmic demon cult story. You literally cannot do both at the same time. Attempting to do both ruins each. Anyway. Iris claims that she is trying to have a baby, but that her husband died in the war. Given that World War I ended in 1918, that is the latest date her husband could have died. Given that she miscarries in 1924, someone other than her husband fathered her fetus. So I've got to ask, who? Who am I supposed to think fathered this baby? One of her brothers? A secret lover we don't know about? Calego himself? Or is Iris trying to get herself involved in the first instance of human parthenogenesis, in yet another deeply frustrating attempt to pull Christian themes into the narrative? Whatever she's trying to do, her brothers have actually accomplished their immediate goals. Lucas and Jonah have gotten their hands on that familiar Calego statue, the one that reminds me so much of the aliens from Scooby-Doo. When Rose asks what she's looking at, Iris says that the statue is, quote, everything she's ever dreamed of. Later, once Rose has been hired, Iris shows her the Coronite amulet, the same one we see around Cassandra's neck in the 90s. Iris explains to Rose what a comet is, except that her explanation is that comets are, quote, the most beautiful and powerful of all the celestial bodies, which I'm pretty sure isn't accurate in any real-world pagan or New Age belief systems, and she also says that comets are, quote, blazing lights in the night sky that can reveal all the secrets of the universe. Seems fake, but okay. Either way, Rose buys it because she's both dumb and smitten with this beautiful, elegant, rich, older woman. Truly, it could not be clearer from the way that Rose looks at Iris throughout this episode that she's got a crush, which brings us back into deeply problematic territory. There's no indication of Iris' sexuality one way or another, but the 90s version of this cult is pretty heavily associated with sapphics. Cassandra is the evil queen to Melody's Snow White, the Maleficent to Melody's Sleeping Beauty and she seduces Annabelle into the cult in the 90s plotline, just like how Iris clearly seduces Rose into the cult in the 20s. Spare me villainous sapphics, you guys. This is Hayes Code bullshit, hence my bringing up the evil queen and Maleficent. And if you're not familiar with the intersection of the Hayes Code, female Disney villains, and evil lesbians, I will drop a link to James Summerton's wonderful video as a evil queen's a gay look at Disney history in the show notes. It is quite long, clocking in at an hour and eight minutes, but it is well worth a watch. To be honest, his whole channel is. But now we are on to our next scene. Iris is having a party, a party at which she will be capturing that spirit photograph Dan glimpsed the demon in earlier, and she runs into a woman named Emma who wants to be a part of everything. This woman will turn out to be important later, she's one of the Baldong witches, and for now, she watches Iris disapprovingly while Rose spies. I think it's important to point out here that Emma's antagonism toward the cult is foreshadowed by her refusal to participate in the cult's weird version of breathwork. And we've seen that happen in this show before. Cassandra, when she was attending the cult meeting at the Visser way back in like episode one or two, 
She also neglected to join in on the weird breathing. That never got mentioned again, but hopefully seeing Emma do the same here means something. What does it mean? I don't know. Hopefully it means that Cassandra is not an evil sapphic after all. Maybe Cassandra is even something resembling a good guy. There's like a theory right now floating around on Reddit that Cassandra could be Rose all grown up, possibly partially possessed by Kalego, but maybe not. There is also the fact that the briefly glimpsed 80s version of Cassandra's late partner, Eleanor, looks a lot like Bobby, aka Melody's mom, aka one of the Baldung. So maybe there's something here after all. Y'all will have to let me know if anything ever comes of that in a hypothetical season two, if one ever gets made, because I'm gonna be honest, I'm not watching any more of this show unless someone is paying me to do it. Like, if this show ever comes back, I will maybe cover it for the podcast on commission. This is nowhere near good enough for me to waste another eight hours or like whatever of my life on another season of it. Unless you pay me. Then I'll do that. But on to the next scene. Rose comes into Iris's bathroom to find Iris sitting on the floor with the bloody implication that she has just had a miscarriage. According to her doctor, trying to conceive again will kill her. And again, I've got to wonder if this is really something to do with Iris's fertility, or if the miscarriages that she's apparently experiencing might instead be because she's trying to have a baby with one of her brothers. Either way, Iris pulls Rose into bed with her and spoons her and tells her that she hopes she has a daughter just like Rose. And between this scene, my suspicions of potential incest regarding Iris, and the enraptured longing looks that Rose has been giving Iris throughout this episode, I am uncomfortable. Cut to Rose on the bathroom floor, scrubbing away that mysterious black mold. I wish I understood more of why the thinning of the veil or whatever causes the mold to appear. Iris says that it's a sign of the cult's devotion, Kalego's body and blood seeping into their reality to call them from the other side. But his body being mold is just kind of nonsense, and it's definitely not really creepy or anything. My proposal is that this needs to be tweaked only slightly. That Kalego's world is infested with this mold, and that the mold spread where the veil is thinnest is what attracts people into the cult in the first place. Mostly, I guess what I'm saying is that when we see Kalego's world in the next episode, the mold needed to be a big part of it, and it's just not. It's so disappointing and inexplicable. But in the next scene, Rose wakes with the implication that she is dreaming of choking on the mold. She gets up to wander and finds Emma stealing the Kalego book. And just as a quick aside, because I can't find any other good point to slyly slip this into my script for the episode, I just want to say that this book gives me vague vibes of Hermaeus Mora's black books from Skyrim's Dragonborn DLC. But Dragonborn and Hermaeus Mora and Apocrypha are so much better than anything this show does. It's ridiculous. But anyway... Iris comes in, identifying Emma as one of the Baldung, and the two women introduce the audience to their opposing ideologies. Emma and the Baldung want the book destroyed, which unfortunately seems impossible given what Iris says later, and Iris wants to use it to bring Kalego into their dimension to save humanity from war, poverty, sickness, and everything else that makes life so unbearable at times. I don't really know if either of them are anything approaching correct on what using the book to usher forth Kalego would actually do. Both the Voss and the Visser attempts resulted in destructive fires and people being pulled into Kalego's world, but the implication is that those rituals weren't successful, so what would a successful ritual actually do? Is this just another, is it better to live free and in pain or to give up freedom to escape pain, moral quandary? If so, it's horrifically undercut by the involvement of the Christian themes. You're not exactly living free if you're just worshipping some other god instead of Kalego? You can't find freedom at the feet of a god, my friends. In any case, Emma says that the Baldung let Kalego free at some point in the past and quote, nearly destroyed everything, to which I say, more information needed. Like, what the hell did the Baldung do? Given that the ritual appears to involve the Karn Comet and its approximately 70 and a half year orbit around the Earth, the comet last showed up sometime in like 1853 or 1854, depending on what time of the year it is when this happens. If anyone knows of anything potentially plot relevant that happened in those years in the real world, feel free to let me know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, and a few minutes of googling didn't give me anything interesting either. I do wonder if the show is trying to reference something real world, but maybe it's not. So my theory for this, then, is what actually happened here ties in with that bit in the opening. The thing about the Karn Comet actually having once had a little buddy up there in its orbit, a counterpart which fell to Earth and created Karnite, I'm assuming that when the Baldung say they set Kalego free, that actually means that their successful ritual pulled that other missing comet down to the Earth, which would certainly be, quote, nearly destroying everything, wouldn't it? You could easily get a nearly apocalyptic winter from a comet impact, and I'll point out that there does appear to be evidence of a cataclysmic comet comet impact happening around 13,000 years ago, which may have contributed to the onset of the Neolithic period. 
An article on Space.com even claims that this impact is memorialized at Gebekli Tepe. If the show does want to tie an extant comet impact into its mythology, that is an opportunity. But in any case, Iris and her brothers are not convinced by Emma's arguments. When she threatens to burn the book and Iris is sure she was bluffing because apparently the book, quote, doesn't burn, Jonah shoots her dead. Given that they needed her, or her fresh blood at least, for the ritual, this isn't exactly a great development for Iris and her cult. With Rose watching, they decide to drain Emma of her blood to try to use it in their ritual anyway, and then Iris sends Rose off to bed after trying to check whether Emma might have turned Rose against them or hurt her in some way. The next time we see Rose, who was a Hollywood atheist last time she mentioned religion, she's praying. Very specifically, she's trying to invoke some kind of protection from Christianity's God, and I am not amused in the least. It is very, there are no atheists in foxholes, and that right there is just more Christian supremacist thinking. But on to the Voss's latest party. It's the night of the ritual, the night of the comets approaching Earth. Everyone is dressed very celestially here, decked in sparkles and stars and diamonds and dark navy blues, all meant to evoke imagery of the night sky. Everyone, that is, except Rose. She, the cult's sacrifice, is robed in this hideous pink dress adorned with flowers, and the symbolism could not be any more obvious. The cult is of the stars, of the comet, and of Karin, and Rose is of the Earth. And so Rose, the Earth, is going to be sacrificed to bring Kalego from the stars. Before the ritual, though, Iris's brother Lucas abandons them and becomes, presumably, the only Voss to survive the fire. Now, let me throw in a quick aside here before we move on to the next scene. Evie Crest said that her father, William Crest, witnessed the snuff film at a friend's bachelor party, the snuff film which somehow escapes the fire despite being right where the fire started. Taking this information in conjunction with what Iris said about the book being impossible to burn, I'm thinking that anything that harbors a piece of Calego can't be burned, period, including the book, the snuff film, all the viscer footage and maybe even Annabelle's paintings. Either way, I will also take this one step further. I think the friend in question was Lucas and that he's behind a lot of this, possibly to rescue his sister, who was reaching out to Annabelle and possibly Eleanor before her to try to get someone to get her out of Calego's realm. And that too could be taken even a step further. Lucas may have something to do with Cassandra perhaps, or perhaps he, as some people on Reddit are theorizing, is related to Davenport and to Samuel. Either way, after Lucas's departure, Iris takes Rose down into the basement of the Voss mansion, the same basement that it shares with the Visser, the one that LGM replicated, I suppose, beneath their compound. The same basement that appears in the snuff film, which Mark and Dan are watching while we are watching the real version. So then the cult dons their masks, and we've still no idea what their symbol means. We do know the meaning of Iris' chanting, though, and her lines make it very clear that they're all supposed to be sacrifices to Kalego, not just Rose. Let our blood run, let our spirit burn, let us nourish this ground in your name indeed. One has to wonder if Iris actually knows what she's saying, or if she's just reading this and it's only being translated for the audience's sake. Either way, Rose definitely didn't know what Iris was saying, so she is completely shocked when Iris slits her throat. Now, because it's a TV show, the, the throat slitting results not in a realistic injury, but in an immediate death, but it doesn't really matter anyway. The portal that Iris opened explodes the mansion into flame only a few seconds later, so if Rose hadn't bled out by then, she would have died anyway. Or maybe not. Because as Annabelle's obsessive paintings of Iris imply, Iris, and potentially any number of others, didn't die in that fire. Instead, she was pulled into Caligo's world and trapped there, and as of the 90s, she wanted out. Back in the present, Dan and Mark puzzle through what must have happened to Melody, and it occurs to these morons for the very first time that they could probably look Annabelle up to see if she's still alive. When Mark is not particularly thrilled by the notion of risking his life for a dead woman, the writers try to have Dan explain why he's so committed to this, but it doesn't really make any sense. He only mentions his dad, and that's only in the context of kind of taking on the guilt that his father might have gotten Melody roped into this dangerous nightmare. His motive at its core doesn't really have anything to do with his dad or the fire that should be his motivation. Instead, he says that, quote, the least he can do is give her death an ounce of meaning, and like, what about your dead dad and mom and sister? Like, in other words, Dan is going to get himself and his best friend potentially killed to give, quote, an ounce of meaning to the death of a woman he's never met. Like, why? And more importantly, why in the entire hell does Mark let this convince him? I saw someone on the Reddit mention that their headcanon for this was that Mark has unrequited romantic feelings for Dan, and given that Mark in the podcast actually was gay, I think I'm taking this on as my own headcanon too, because otherwise this doesn't make sense. 
Melody had her lesbianism removed, so let's make sure Mark gets to keep his own homosexuality. I've decided that Mark lets Dan treat him this badly because he's in love with him. And even if I don't think Mark's, like, a fantastic person or anything, Mark deserves better than that. So off they go to find Annabelle Cho. She's in the same mental institution, which is hilarious from a you could have found her so easily at any point in this investigation perspective, and she's being played by the same actress, which is hilarious from a you barely even tried to make her look any older, what are you doing perspective. Anyway, Annabelle says she's been waiting for a Dan to appear to save Melody, which isn't, like, impossible, but it is low-key dumb. Like, did Melody even mention Dan to her? Did we ever see that? I remember Melody mentioning that she was having conversations with someone in her dreams, but did she mention Dan to Annabelle? Did I forget that? I'm gonna give the show the benefit of the doubt and assume I'm just forgetting that this happened, but I don't fully believe that. Anyway, on to the next episode. We open with a final prologue. It's a tape Melody made of her hanging out with Jess on a swing set, and I've gotta say again that Melody and Jess's relationship simply is not appropriate. Grown people do not want to spend that much time with children that they're not related to unless they're up to something. Melody is not this girl's relative, teacher, mentor, or anything like that. She's just a nosy neighbor. It's creepy, and I'm going to go ahead and say that this is one of those patriarchy catch-22s. It's that thing of misogyny claiming that women are inherently weak and sexually submissive, which means that they couldn't possibly rape or molest or be predators, which means that we as a culture are far less inclined to notice when women are behaving in predatory ways, thus allowing real female predators to operate with ease and providing me the opportunity to point out that if Melody had been a male character instead acting this way toward a little girl, her views of the show would have pointed out the inappropriateness here. Instead, I haven't seen anyone mentioning that, like, a neighbor acting this way toward a child is fucking terrifying behavior that demands intervention from the child's parents. Anyway. We cut to Melody locked up at Rockland, screaming for help because she, quote, doesn't belong there, to which I say, okay. The opening shot for this scene before we actually cut to Melody is very reminiscent of the elevator shot in The Shining, though. It's not especially meaningful for the narrative, I think, but I did notice it. So Steven comes in to talk to Melody, and I've gotta say, I think this is one of her worst scenes. In retrospect, I really enjoyed not having to see her in the previous episode. Melody is by far the worst thing about this show. She is arrogant, she's entitled, she's nosy, she's self-righteous, she's annoying, and most damningly, she is completely and utterly stupid, as evidenced by the decisions that she makes throughout this episode. In the meantime, though, she is screaming at Stephen about how everything must be his fault. That Samuel must have gotten all the information he knows about her from Stephen. And that's possible, I guess, but I don't think we as the viewers are meant to believe that it's true. Whatever the truth is about Samuel and what he does or doesn't know about Melody, though, Stephen is the only one making any good decisions here. He's going to keep Melody locked up in the safety of Rockland for another few hours until he can whisk her away to a safer spot outside the city. And you've gotta wonder what would've happened if Melody had just tapped into some hitherto unseen self-preservation instincts and agreed to this plan. If Melody's not here, does the cult kill Jess? Maybe, but I doubt it. As we see later, Jess is the replaceable cog in this machine, not Melody. If the cult doesn't have their witch blood, they might not go ahead with the ritual at all. In any case, though, Melody tells Stephen that Samuel's taken Jess prisoner and intends to use her in a murderous ritual and that only she could possibly save the day. She outright mocks the notion of a social worker coming to help, and I will admit that a social worker isn't the right person to send if a child has been kidnapped and is being held prisoner in the hours leading up to her ritualistic murder. That's like a task for a SWAT team or something. So like, stop mocking the idea of calling the authorities, and how about you make the goddamn police do their actual jobs for once? Even if they aren't especially useful in the fight against the cult, at least it'll mean that they take a brief break from terrorizing the populace. So, from there, Stephen pretends that he's going to let Melody out of Rockland after he lets her see Annabelle, but thank goodness that's a trick. He takes Melody to Annabelle's room and locks them up together. Hopefully, this means that Annabelle hasn't shown any violent tendencies in a while, though, or else this is also irresponsible as fuck. Either way, Melody breaks it to Annabelle that the woman she's been drawing, Iris, is a murderer, and Annabelle starts scratching out Iris's face. She says that she can't see Kalego anymore, or perhaps it's Karen that she can't see anymore. It's a bit unclear. But either way, one assumes that this is because she's no longer in contact with the Visser Mold, not because anything has actually changed in the world at large. Annabelle reveals that Cassandra said the ritual will be tonight, and she asks Melody to stay with her, but Melody isn't interested. In Melody's mind, Melody is the only one who could possibly save the day, and so of course she has to go get her stupid ass in trouble. 
So Melody, according to Annabelle, goes to the window and escapes Rockland. Never mind that Rockland, being a mental hospital, obviously wouldn't have windows that could be opened wide enough for a human to fit through, either for the purposes of escape or for suicide. It's this bizarre moment of gesturing toward the notion of unreliable narrators, but it's played as a weird joke that doesn't actually contribute anything to the narrative. The point of textually unreliable narrators is to leave the audience feeling disoriented, and as if we might not be able to trust either the protagonist's perception or our own eyes. This, though, this thing about Melody just, like, going out the window, flying away, this bit here just feels like the writers couldn't think of a way for Melody to actually escape Rockland, which makes sense, given that Rockland would be specifically designed to prevent escapes, and that Melody, I must remind you, is a complete idiot. And or that the writers couldn't fit a sequence of Melody actually escaping into the runtime of the show. And, like, maybe you guys could have fit that sequence into the show if you hadn't wasted the entire previous episode on a useless flashback that gave us only a little bit of information that could have easily been communicated to the audience in any other fashion. So, Dan is momentarily thrilled that his father turned out not to be a villain after all, but then Annabelle insists that Melody needs Dan to save her. Oh, and by the way, Jess is still alive. Good thing they never tried to find her or anything, or else we could have actually gotten to the point without getting strung along through stupid shit for eight entire episodes. And just to top off the insulting Christian supremacist bullshit that's happening here, this scene gives us the reveal that Jess not only survived the evil sapphic pagans that tried to kill her, she grew up to be a nun. Fucking kill me. Anyway, Annabelle gives Nan and Mark some more old tapes, which I don't think Annabelle would be allowed to keep in a place like Rockland in the first place, but fine, whatever. This is clumsy as hell, and it's really annoying, but alright, let's just move on. Dan just so happens to have this special kid's camera that only very briefly was even produced, and that's exactly what he needs to see Jess's tapes. It's very convenient. Let's just move on. These tapes, we find out, are what we saw at the opening of this episode, plus another that's like Melody's last testament as she enters the viscer and prepares to rescue Jess. She lists the crimes that she thinks Samuel is guilty of and blames him wholly for whatever's about to happen next. Then she heads into the viscer proper and takes the elevator up to the sixth floor. Thank goodness she never gave Cassandra that key back, I guess, unless Cassandra isn't a villain after all. So when Melody finds Jess, she's been locked in and she doesn't know where her mother is. Yet when Melody breaks in through the fire escape, Jess is still not prepared to believe that Samuel and Cassandra and the cult in general are the bad guys here. That explains why Jess didn't run away through the fire escape, but why the hell does she think she's been locked in this abandoned apartment if she still thinks they're the good guys? So Melody goes to bang on the apartment door from the inside, as if that's a reasonable use of her time, and then gets to work convincing Jess that the cult intends to kill her. Except that she does this by implying that occult rituals are inherently evil, and let me be the first to inform you that no, they're not. As a matter of fact, all forms of Satanism that I know of specifically ban harming animals or children. The myth of the murderous demon cult is just that. It's a fucking myth. If anything, a satanic occult or magical ritual is way more likely to be a bunch of dorks having sex with each other or masturbating. An occult ritual is genuinely just a collection of nerds getting together for a religious LARP. It's not scary, it's silly. And this cultural narrative that non-Christian religious rituals are some shade of grey or that they're outright evil, whereas Christian religious rituals are good, is just Christian supremacy. And words cannot express how sick I am of that shit. Anyway, Melody decides to prove just how fucking stupid she is now. When someone knocks on the door to talk to Jess, Melody has this minute-long chat with her about what she needs to do, and then she stays behind while Jess runs. And like, why? There was more than enough time for both of them to get away. Melody truly only stays because the plot needs her to. It's the clumsiest, shittiest writing thus far in the show, and honestly, the writers should be pretty ashamed that they didn't manage to do this properly. It would have been such an easy fix. Just have John Smith break down the door a moment earlier, forcing Melody to fight him off while Jess runs. Then she can get captured, just like in canon. It's such a weird choice to try to make her sacrifice herself here when there's truly no reason for it. You can't even pretend they were trying to do any kind of religious self-sacrifice themes here, given that Melody's not even in any real danger danger from the cult. The worst danger she's in is of getting trapped in Kalego's world, which is hardly a fate worse than death, considering she seems no worse for the wear when she's finally rescued. Also, I'm not amused by John Smith's role in this part of the story. He's just here to be a large, threatening brown man, to which I say, no thank you, and do better. Like, the cult has two male members. One is a white, nerdy type that operates via personality. The other is a surly brown dude that's just there to be the white guy's muscle and to ultimately beat a white-passing woman into temporary submission. 
I expect way better than that shit from a diverse show like this. Moving on. When Melody wakes, Samuel's got her tied to a chair in the basement of the Visser, and the cult is gathered before the snuff film that Cassandra was so desperately looking for just a few episodes ago. How did she manage to get it since then? Who the fuck knows? The show does not care to tell us. You found your way home, Samuel says, in this soft, faux comforting voice, and if we take all of his behavior toward Melody, especially in this episode, into consideration, I'm left with no other choice than to assume he's, like, genuinely into her. And given that Dan also appears to have somehow fallen in love with her or some shit just by watching her awful attempts at video recording and journalistic investigation, I'd say it's clear that the writers imagined Melody as a much more compelling character than the one they actually managed to write. She's awful, and it's not like she's some stunning knockout to make up for being awful, so what the fuck do these men all see in her? Because I don't see it at all, especially since Samuel's already nailing Tamara. Like, what are you looking at Melody for, dude? That's ridiculous. So, now Samuel tells Melody the obvious. She was the one he really needed, not Jess. Jess was not special. Her role could be performed by anyone, which has the lame side effect of making it clear that Jess being born in the building meant nothing after all. What was the point of including that detail then? I think it's from the source material, yes, but if you're not going to use it in any interesting way, why not just leave it on the cutting room floor along with the rest of the podcast plot? But anyway, I'm really unclear on what Tamara understands about what Samuel asked her to do here. No one in either Iris or Samuel's cult scenes are surprised by the throat slitting, so I have to assume that everyone knew it would be part of the ritual. But Melody certainly seems to think that Tamara doesn't know she's agreeing to be the sacrifice, and Tamara doesn't say anything to clear it up either way. And if Tamara was agreeing to be the sacrifice here, what exactly does that mean for her? Does she get to, like, live in paradise in Kalego's world or whatever while Kalego gets to jaunt around on her body or something? Clearly her death isn't actually necessary to open the door, given that Bobby does this without a sacrifice later. So I assume it's some kind of a possession thing or something. I don't know. This is also unclear, and I've seen a million people on Reddit all insisting that their interpretation was the right one, and so I'll say again. If people who have read your story, or watched your story, have to fight about what the hell actually happened in your story, you didn't do a good job of telling your story. But now it's ritual time. Everyone puts on their masks, and I've gotta say, the 20s ritual was much more fashionable. Like, one girl here is in a tube top and jeans. Dress up. This is important. So. Samuel slits Melody's palm, and Melody just stands there bleeding on the statue, doing absolutely nothing to try to interfere with the ritual. Like, wasn't that your whole goal? You don't want anyone to get their third slit, so like, push the statue over or something. That will probably stop it. If nothing else, it's gonna stall them for a minute, and Samuel won't immediately slit Tamara's throat. But no, Melody just stares in calm silence like she's watching this with as much detachment from these events as I am. And then we get a silly CGI portal that forms over the cult's seal. Samuel I fucks it for a moment before Iris appears, which was obviously not what he was expecting. Iris turns to Melody, and then Jess reveals that she is lurking on the staircase because I guess she's just as fucking stupid as Melody is? Like, kid, you got away. What the fuck are you doing back here? You didn't know that you specifically weren't necessary for the ritual. Why are you here? Other than that so the writers don't have to come up with some other way for Dan and Mark to witness what happened to Melody. And Christ, it could have just been a dream or something. Even that would have been better than this brainless contrivance. So, while Iris is distracted by the appearance of Jess, Samuel sidles over and takes Melody's hand, and I'm telling you guys, this dude is all in on Melody for reasons I cannot possibly fathom. And then, the viscer bursts into flames with the implication that everyone involved in the ritual was pulled into the demon world. But what happened to Iris? Is she still in Kaleko's world, or did she escape into the 90s? The audience has and will get no idea this season. Instead, we get a horrifically clunky are you following this recapping info dump courtesy of Mark. And I've gotta say it again, this is bad writing. I just watched all of that shit. You don't have to have a character walk me through what I just saw. How stupid do you guys think your audience is? It's a waste of time, and it's extraordinarily insulting, and I just can't wrap my mind around why in the world the writers thought it was a good idea. So Dan once again talks Mark into going along with his stupid plan to go back to the compound to try to force Davenport to help him save Melody. 
And I'll reiterate, Mark's willingness to go along with Dan's nonsense after the way Dan has treated him over the course of this entire show's plot is just ridiculous, and I am left with no choice but to assume that Mark is in love with him and not thinking clearly. Love is the only explanation for Dan's willingness to throw his life away for a chance of helping Melody, and it is the only explanation for Mark's willingness to throw his life away to help Dan. I cannot come up with anything else. So at the compound, Dan tells Davenport that he has found more tapes, and so Davenport lets him in to take a look. Dan accuses Davenport of having known what was on the tapes before Dan actually restored them, which is obviously true, but which Davenport denies, albeit while dodging the opportunity to provide a reasonable alternative explanation. He instead explains that the tape serves as a window into another world, and that he got a hold of those tapes somehow 25 years after the fire at the Visser because they finally came up for auction after languishing in a storage facility. Dan's father's storage facility. Davenport reveals that this is the reason Dan's father, mother, and sister were killed, and I will repeat that I don't think Dan has so much as mentioned his mother once in this entire show, despite the fact that we saw her on screen and so we know she was around. So the Bald Dung Witches apparently burned down Dan's house, thinking that Stephen was keeping the tapes there in an attempt to destroy the tapes. Except, as Iris has already said, the book doesn't burn, and as we've already seen, the snuff film didn't burn either. So why would the witches think that a fire could take out these tapes? Like, get a new M.O. Fire clearly doesn't work. Between you and me, I'm going to hope that this is some kind of a misdirect here, that this nonsense solution is not actually the truth, and that the actual truth is that Dan's dad, or perhaps even Dan's sister, or baby Dan himself, tried to rescue Melody, only to accidentally burn the place down, just like Iris and Samuel did. But like I said, if that turns out to be true in season two, you guys are going to have to tell me about it, because I will not be tuning in. And now we've reached the point at which Dan shows all his cards rather gracelessly. He insists that Melody is trapped, not dead, and that Davenport has to help him rescue her. Davenport, though, insists that the other world is not a place that a human being could survive inside. How did he get this information? Oh, from studying the other world. How did he do that? Who knows? Who cares? Not the show, that's for sure. So Dan points out that Samuel is also trapped in the other world, but Davenport says he doesn't care. Maybe he's bluffing, maybe he's not. If he's not, though, he's certainly right. Samuel is a fucking lunatic who definitely deserves to be left in the grave he dug for himself. And Dan doesn't take that notion kindly. He rushes Davenport only to be surprised when Davenport goes to shoot him in self-defense. And then Mark hits Davenport over the head with a crowbar, and he and Dan walk away without even bothering to take away Davenport's gun. It is stupid, stupid writing down into the tunnels they go. Dan suddenly knows all about how this shit is supposed to work, despite never actually learning any of it on screen. Suddenly, he knows for sure that the blood in the Wellspring refrigerator is all Baldung witch blood, and, um, how exactly did Davenport get it all then? Suddenly, he knows for sure that playing the tapes thinned the veil between the worlds such that the ritual could be performed. And, most unreasonably of all, suddenly he knows for sure that the room he only very briefly inspected before being conked on the head is full of, quote, synthetic Karenite panels to, quote, replace the comet. And, um, where'd you get that little tidbit of info, buddy? You had no idea what the hell you were looking for last time, and now you know all about synthetic Karenite panels and shit? Like, we haven't even established that synthetic Karenite was possible before this moment, let alone that Davenport had a whole bunch of it. But fine. Whatever. It's the 11th hour, and we've got to get shit done, so now our idiot protagonist is temporarily smart so we can get him where he needs to go. Whatever. Don't expect it to last, though, because it will not. So Dan convinces Mark once again to join him on his stupid suicide mission, and he does it by implying that Mark only cares about Dan so that he can get a fun story for his podcast, and Dan is just a really fucking awful friend, isn't he? I will say it again. Mark isn't, like, the greatest guy to ever live, but he at least deserves better than this. Unfortunately for me, though, he agrees. Dan talks Mark's love-struck ass into this, and down they go into Moldville. And then there's Bobby, pointing a gun at the back of Mark's head. Dan insists that he and Melody, quote, found each other somehow, which is undeniably romantic language. So let me repeat. You cannot fall in love with someone you've only ever seen recordings of and had dreams about. That is stalker shit. 
back to Bobby. She's got this tuning fork that's apparently the right one, because I guess Iris and Samuel were even dumber than I realized and used the wrong one. And when Mark figures out that she's one of the witches, she confirms that only a witch can use both the spell and the key to perform the ritual properly. She insists that she wasn't actually going to let Davenport enter the other world, that she was just using him to arrange and presumably fund the creation of the right circumstances to perform the ritual in her lifetime. Mark mentions here that the Baldungs gave up their magic to keep Kalego locked away, and, um, I double-checked, because this threw me off so bad. This has never, ever been mentioned before. It's another thing that Mark apparently discovered off-screen, like the fake Melody's car crash. And, like, why is the writing like this? How fucking hard would it have been to mention this in a previous episode when we saw our first Baldung witch. Why does this feel like they just went ahead and shot their literal first draft of the story? Or like they were literally writing this as they went along and realized too late to change it that they'd forgotten to mention or hint at particular information before it becomes relevant. It's just so bizarre. But whatever. Bobby Baldung cannot use magic anymore, and that's convenient, but who cares? What's important is that Bobby is Melody's mother and that she blames herself for what happened to Melody. She gave Melody up specifically to keep Melody from getting involved in the occult goings-on, except that she paid the price of her bloodline anyway, and now Bobby intends to get her back. Assuming that Bobby is not a liar. Now, while the shaky camera work here is making me dizzy anytime I'm not looking at the subtitles, Dan and Bobby and Mark agree to team up. They're going to open the portal, and then Dan's going to get inside to save Melody and to pull her out. Bobby says that Davenport's thing about the realm being unsurvivable is just Davenport being a moron, which is certainly a choice. Like, why introduce that as a plot beat if you're just going to immediately throw it out? Anyway, say welcome back to that ridiculous CGI because here it is again, and Dan steps into the glowy mess to enter Kalego's world, which is such an enormous letdown. No lie, it is just the exact same sets with some glowy shit floating around. Like, this is supposed to be some kind of an eldritch pocket dimension or some shit? And you couldn't even build a spooky set? Like, at the very least, put that sparkly mold all over the normal sets. This is just so low effort, it is ridiculous. And given that everything looks completely cozy and safe and fine, Dan sits down for dinner with his sister, his dad, and his unnamed and mostly unacknowledged mom, with the implication that Kalego is luring him into complacency. It's very Lost in Dreams from Dragon Age Origins, meets Patrick Wilson wandering around in the further in the first Insidious movie, but it's nowhere near as interesting or as impactful as either of those sequences. So, Dan runs off from his father's house and winds up wandering an infinite Visser hallway until he finds a fake version of the Visser conference room and passes through it to a fake version of Father Roos's church. Melody is just sitting on the floor in there, waiting for her mother to arrive, which is... boring. She doesn't appear to be in any danger, but it's also not exactly a particularly good dream. It seems to me very much to be a purgatory state, and given how much I dislike Melody, I'm honestly more inclined to blame her than Kalego for this. Bobby described Kalego as wanting to keep people in his realm because he's desperate and lonely, and like, I don't know, I just like to imagine that he tried to hang out with Melody or something, and was like, ugh, this one sucks, I guess I'll just leave her here to wait around for her mom, because there's literally nothing else to her. Like, it's a huge indictment of her character. There really isn't actually anything else to her other than, wah wah, where's my mommy? Of course she spent 25 years just waiting on the floor. She doesn't have a fucking personality beyond that. Anyway, Kalego apparently realizes that Dan is trying to escape with Melody, so everything goes a bit wonky. Church bells, earthquakes, and the way back to the compound takes them instead to an apartment with an old TV that's showing pictures of the compound on every channel. While Dan is distracted by this TV, Melody gets distracted by the chanting in the vents again, and then she turns around to find Kalego creeping up on her. And, like, um, I hate to say it, but he's not threatening. At all. Especially after Bami's description of him as just some lonely guy trapped in his own dimension. I don't even get the vaguest hint of menace from him, in spite of Melody's hysterical screaming. Have you guys considered just, like, kindly asking him to let you leave? Like I said, Melody is boring as fuck. If you just asked nicely, he would probably let her go. Or, fuck, maybe Kalego's in love with her too. The entire universe does revolve around her after all, in case you forgot. <sighs> I can't stand her. <laughs> but anyway, speaking of men who are inexplicably in love with Melody, here comes Samuel out of nowhere. Seriously, there's just an open door to like a glowy void, and Samuel bursts through it unbidden and seizes Melody to pull her through, which apparently lets Melody escape the demon dimension. Does that mean Samuel escaped? 
Who knows? We don't get to see him again, which implies he didn't end up in 2019. Maybe he ended up in 1994 with Dan, or maybe he got sent back to 1924 to the remains of the boss mansion, or something else entirely. I, I don't know. And since it's a question to be answered in the next season, it may never be coming, and I honestly don't care anyway. So, Melody wakes up on the floor of the replica basement to find Mark and Bobby staring at her. The scene fucking drags, as so many of the show's scenes do, and Melody doesn't seem too concerned where the hell Dan is. And Mark's only tactic is to shout Dan into the ether, like that's gonna help find him. And it won't. Because Dan wakes up in a hospital way back in 1994, as evidenced by a news broadcast about the death of Kurt Cobain, and a hilariously inappropriate and logistically nonsensical shot of the Twin Towers being reflected in his hospital window. Like, the Twin Towers. Instead of just having the fucking nurse say that it's 1994, you showed us the Twin Towers? It's just... It's just so indicative of the utter nonsense that this show is. Why write someone giving a clear answer to a straightforward question when you can go for peak drama instead? Holy fuck. So yeah, that was Archive 81. It's not good. It's like a D, maybe a D plus, maybe a D minus. If you're very generous, maybe a C. You know, depending on your own personal tolerance levels when it comes to bad speculative fiction. I hate, you know all sci-fi fantasy horror when it's really bad, primarily because I so desperately adore it when it's good. And this is bad. There's enough in here to have made something really good, and instead they made something utterly mediocre at best, and I'm just bored and really let down. I'm pretty sure right now that I'm going to try to break this story down into what I liked about it and put it back together in a way that I think I would have personally enjoyed, but that is a project for another day. And one that's not really a reasonable use of my time, if I'm being completely honest. But you can probably look for that in the near future, maybe on this podcast feed, or maybe as a part of Everything's Unoriginal, or maybe just over on the Patreon. We will see what happens on that front. In the meantime, if you enjoyed my coverage of Arcade 81, thank you for listening. If you didn't, I'm sorry. I will be covering plenty more shows, movies, and other stories in the future, so maybe come back when I cover something else you're into. Alternately, head over to my Patreon, where for $1 per month, you will get access to occasional polls helping me decide what it is that I will watch for this show. Um, if you don't see anything that interests you on the poll, you are, of course, always welcome to leave suggestions in the comments. Uh, as always, $5 patrons have access to full-length, mostly unedited reactions to everything that I watch and cover here on the pod. If you are enjoying this show, please feel free to leave a rating or a review on your podcatcher of choice to tell a friend about the show or to talk about it on social media. Every little bit helps and is very much appreciated. And of course, honesty is always key. I will never be one of those creators who pressures people into leaving only five stars or keep your opinions to yourself. I don't believe in that stuff. Beyond that, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I will be back very soon with whatever my patrons choose for me to cover next. It will probably, at this point, it looks like it's going to be Marianne. In the meantime, though, as always, thank you so much for listening. And then we get a silly CGI portrait that forms over the cult's seal. Portrait? I said portrait. What the fuck?